What's the most common type of end game in chess? This is a very important question. I'm gonna give you the answer in just a second, but first I wanna give you the opportunity to guess and see if you can figure it out yourself. So I'm gonna to present to you seven different chess positions or different types of positions, I should say, and I want you to try to figure out which one is most common, which one shows up the most often in a game of chess, okay? So let me show you what these positions are. Here's the first one, kings and pawns only. There are no queens, no rooks, no knights, no bishops on the board. It's just kings, it's just pawns. Okay, that's the first type of position. The second type of position is the same thing, except now each side has a knight, okay? So kings, pawns, and now each player has a knight. The third type of position is the same thing, except now we have the bishops. So both players have kings, pawns, and bishops, and you'll notice these bishops are on the same color square. So if you look carefully, both of these bishops control only the light squares, okay? So same color bishops is what we would say. The next one is bishops, but this time they are on opposite color squares. So this white bishop controls the white squares, and this black bishop controls the dark squares, okay? So this is what's called an opposite color bishop ending, okay? Next on the list, we have a knight against a bishop. So again, we have the kings, we have the pawns, but this time one player has a knight and one player has a bishop. It could also have been swip, switched where white has the bishop, black has the knight. Next, we have the rooks. So it's the same thing, kings and pawns, but now each side has one rook. And then last, we have the queens. Again, kings, pawns, and each side has a queen. Now, one of these seven types of positions is more common than all the other ones, and it's significantly more common. Okay, there's a clear winner here. And what I want you to do is just pause the video, think about it, and put your answer down in the comments. Let me know what you think, and then I'm gonna tell you the answer. So just to recap, we've got kings and pawns only, we've got the knights, we've got the same color bishops, we've got the opposite color bishops, we've got the knight against the bishop, we've got the rook, and we've got the queen. Okay, those are the different types of endings. I'm gonna jump back to the beginning here, with the kings and pawns. You tell me what you think the most common one is. All right, well, hopefully you had a chance to put your guess down below. Now, the answer is coming out of this book, 100 Endgames You Must Know. Now, for those of you who know, this is a series, an endgame series that where we're going through this book, okay, Silman's Complete Endgame Course. But I did say that I was gonna pause from time to time and kind of include some extra stuff from this book. That's this episode, okay? This episode's gonna have information from this book as well as Silman's Complete Endgame Course, okay? So, he actually has, in, in 100 Endgames You Must Know, there is a chart where he analyzed four million games and recorded the percentage that different types of end games happen, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through these seven positions one by one with the least common to the most common, just out of these seven. There are other types of end games that are covered on this chart, which I'm not gonna get into really, but I wanna focus on these seven, okay? So number seven on our list is coming in at 1.07% is the opposite color bishop endings, okay? So where the bishops are on opposite color squares. This one is on dark squares, this one is on light squares, okay? Only 1.07% of the game. So if you play 100 chess games, you're only likely to get something like this one time, okay? That's good to know. Next on the list, at 1.44% is the knights, okay? So kings, pawns, and each side has a knight, 1.44%. Next on the list, we have the same color bishops, okay? So here we go again with the bishops, but this time instead of opposite color, same color bishops, all right? Next on the list, at 1.73%, we have queen endings, okay? So where there's kings, there's pawns, and then just queens are left, 1.73%, uh, okay? And now, for the last three, we see a big, a big jump up, okay? So we are at 1.73%. Now we go up to 3%, all right? So 3% of the time, you're gonna have a king and pawn ending, all right? So 100 games, three of those games are gonna make it to an end game where there's just kings and pawns, all right? That's, I mean, that's three times as much as like the opposite color bishops, for example, right? So 3% here, and then very, very close to this, 3.09% is going to be, uh, where did it go? The knight against the bishop, okay? Where one player has a knight, the other player has the bishop, okay? So that's also very close uh, close to the other one. And then last but not least, the, you could probably figure it out, the only one that I haven't talked about, 
in 8% of the games, 8.01% of the games is rook endings, where each side has one rook. Okay, this is very significant, especially when you compare it to the other percentages. We went from 3% up to 8%. Okay, this is valuable, and it's important that you understand that, like, okay, it's if you're going to spend some time learning some end games, maybe you should focus on rook endings because they happen more than all the other ones. And so one more thing I want to point out about these statistics is if you add up all of these percentages that I just mentioned to you, it comes out to be 19.87, so just about 20%. And what that means is 20% of the time, you're going to end up in an end game that looks like one of these. It might be kings and pawns only. It might be the knights. It might be the bishops. It might be opposite. It might be a knight and a bishop. It might be rooks or it might be queens. But you're going to end up in some kind of end game where it's relatively equal. 20% of the games. That is very significant, right? So, I mean, one in five games, having the better end game knowledge puts you at a significant advantage. OK, so I thought that was really interesting. And I hope that that, you know, let me know what you guys think about that. Like, did you know it was rook endings? Did you think it was something else? Um, what are your thoughts about that? But that's the first thing that I wanted to share with you. All right. The next thing I want to share with you guys from this book uh, had to do with the effectiveness of different pieces on different places of the chessboard. So if that doesn't make sense, just bear with me. I want to ask you a question. Which chess piece does not benefit from being in the center of the board? That's my question. Which chess piece, the king, the queen, the rook, the knight, the bishop, or the pawn, does not benefit from being in the center of the board? Well, the answer is the rook. The rook is the piece, and he shows some interesting charts in the book that kind of illustrate this, but if you count up the number of squares that a rook can go to in the center of the board. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 squares. What's really, really interesting is if you move the rook to here and you count it again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Anywhere that you move the rook, it's going to cover 14 squares. Now, of course, I'm talking about an empty board, but it's 14 anywhere which is kind of fascinating. If you try that with a different piece, it doesn't work that way. For example, the knight, one, two, three, four, five, sorry, that's not how the knight moves, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, becomes two in the corner or on the edge, it's four, um, sorry, four, or it could be like six if it's here, or you know, even somewhere here, it could be three, you get the idea, it's, it's more in the center, right? All pieces except the rooks, that, that is true. Bishops, same thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can see immediately as I move it to the center, we get an extra six squares covered, right? So that's just something that was kind of fascinating to me. I had actually never thought about it. Like I always tell people like control the center of the board because your pieces are more effective in the center. It honestly had never really occurred to me that rooks don't, don't apply to that, which kind of blew my mind, right? I've been playing chess for like 30 years and I just never thought about that. So I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you guys. I thought that was really interesting. And the takeaway as far as from an end game perspective is that a lot of times rooks do good along the, the outside edge of the board, right? Because they still have maximum effectiveness as far as controlling as many squares, but they're not going to be they're not easy to attack on the edge of the board, right? It's harder for other pieces to kind of get at them. And so that's just something to keep in mind, right? Like, you know, yes, you could have your rook here attacking this way, but you could also have it be far away and it's still attacking there, right? So just keep that in mind. All right, now I want to change gears and talk to you about one more thing from this book before we move on to Silman's. And this has to do with the king and how the king can take multiple routes to get to a particular square. So in the book, he talks about a king that's trying to go from, let's just say, a4 to h4. And of course, you could just walk, you know, straight there. But in chess, the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could also go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, you could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And he points out that there are actually, well, if you want to take a guess, how many different routes do you think there are for the king to go from here to here? Well, uh, apparently the answer is 393, 393 different ways to go from here to here. Now, 
your next question is probably Nelson, why do I care? Like what's wrong with this route, right? Like I'll just, I'll just go with the easy one. Why, why would I want to do something else? Well, I'm glad you asked. The most important reason is when your opponent's king is somewhere and you're trying to box it out or keep it from going to a certain area of the board, but still get to where you want to go. And in that case, you would kind of move towards the king. So a good example is this position right here. It's white to play and win. White's pawn is going forward. And uh, if you want to pause, you should be able to figure this out with what I said. What's the winning move for white? Well, the only winning move for white in this position is king to e6. Okay, this is what we call the crooked path. Okay, and basically you could go for the straight path, but the crooked path is the one that actually wins the game. Okay, this wins the game. This loses the game. I'm not losing it. It draws the game. Okay, so let me show you. The normal person who doesn't know about the crooked path would probably just go here. And then black moves. You go here, black moves. You go here, black moves. You go here, black moves. You take the pawn, you're pretty happy. And then bam, your king gets stuck. Okay, your king is stuck. You can't get out. He's always going to trap you. Even if you push your pawn, this is just a stalemate. Game is a draw. Okay? So, going back to this position... The crooked path can actually help you win. So if you noticed, while you were doing that, Black's king was kind of sneaking around to the side and then coming in, on, you know, to block you in. So what you can do is play king e6. And now if the king tries to do the same thing, you go king d5 and look at this. You have taken away these squares from the Black king. And so instead, they have to do something like this instead. And now you can go back and you're not wasting any time, right? One, two, three. One, two, three, doesn't really matter. You're still getting there. The king can try to come around, but you're you're still boxing them out. You go here, they go here, you take the pawn. Look at the position. Last time, the king was sitting here, and he just jumped in and trapped you. Now he's too far, and he gives you time to escape, and you get the queen, and you're going to win the game. Okay, it's actually an, it's an amazing concept if you've never seen it before. Fascinating position. So, um, that's just something to keep in mind. Crooked path. Like if you need to use your king to block out your opponent's king and still go somewhere, maybe you should use a crooked path. Okay. So that's really, really interesting. And I hope you guys understand that. Very, very important. All right, guys, that's all I wanted to cover for today from this book. Now we're going to move over to Silman's complete endgame course. And I have some takeaways for you from this one. And so let's just jump into these. All right. So now we're moving on to part two in this book which is targeted for players rated between 1,000 and 1,200. Okay, if you're less than 1,000, make sure you watch the previous video where we talked about the staircase mate and the box mate and stalemate. But as long as you're good with that, you should be good to move on with, with the lesson here. Okay, so in this lesson, he talks about what can and what cannot checkmate a, a king who has no support. Okay, so if your opponent's king has no pieces left, only the king, can you checkmate them with, with a particular piece? Right, that's what he talks about. The queen is obvious, and if you watch the previous lesson, you'll know, yes, you can definitely checkmate with the king and a queen against the king, all right? Two rooks is also obvious. You can definitely checkmate with two rooks against the king, okay? You can use the staircase mate, like we talked about. Uh, the queen, you can use the box mate. Even one rook, you can checkmate, okay? You can use the box method, where you make a box, and you just keep making it smaller and smaller, and eventually you checkmate. OK, but what about let's go to the next the two bishops. Can you checkmate with just two bishops and a king against the king? The answer is yes, you can. And he doesn't go over it in the book, so we're, we won't cover it here either. But it's relatively straightforward. You just make this kind of barrier like this. And then eventually you push the king to the edge of the board and then eventually you push it to the corner. We'll talk about that in a future lesson. But yes, you can checkmate with two bishops. OK, what about a bishop and a knight? The answer is yes, you can, but it's not easy. Okay, this one is not easy. And he talks about it in the book and he basically says, look, I don't even think it's worth your time because it is so rare. And actually, if I go back to this 100 Endgames You Must Know book, just for a second, it's listed on that chart. And I'm going to check for you what it is. Um, it's very, very low percentage of games that it showed up. And let's see, let's see, where's it at? So the... Let's, yeah, Knight and Bishop versus King. Here it is. 0 0.02. 0 0.02% of the time will you get this position. A lot of players have played chess their whole life and have never had it. Okay? I think I got it one time in like a Blitz game. 
but it's, it's extremely rare. So if you don't know how to do it, don't worry about it. If you want to learn, I have a video on the channel. I talk through the method. It's not like that crazy, but it is going to take you some time. So it's up to you, but Silman recommends don't even wasting your time with it. Okay. But just know you can checkmate, uh, but it's not easy. All right. The next one is one that, uh, well, let me ask you guys. Do you think you can checkmate with two knights and a king against the king? The answer is you cannot unless your opponent just blunders and lets you, okay? So, and I'll show you the position that he talks about in the book. This is one that is worth going over. So we'll come back to this one in just a second. But the answer is you cannot unless they blunder, okay? And then, of course, if you only have a king and a knight, you can't checkmate. Even if you put the king in the corner, you put your king in an ideal position, and you try to position the knight to checkmate, he can escape. And if you try to position your knight to stop that, uh, the best case scenario would be a stalemate. All right, you, you can't move, but nothing's attacking the king. That's just a stalemate. Same thing with a lone bishop. Okay, if you put the bishop here with the king here, you know this is an example of stalemate. Uh, you can't actually checkmate the king. And then the only other one that I didn't cover was a pawn, and a pawn cannot checkmate by itself. Now, if you can promote the pawn to becoming a queen, that's a different story. Okay, but if black knows what they're doing to stop you from doing that or and they're in a certain position, then you won't be able to. So this one kind of depends. Right. But as far as just checkmating with the pawn, you can't. But there are situations where you can get the queen. All right. So let's take a quick look at the two knights and the king against the king. So this is the position that Silman uses. And notice black's king is in check and black has to make a decision. Do they move into the corner or do they move over here? And if they blunder and for whatever reason decide to move into the corner, then yeah, you can win, you simply go here and it's checkmate, okay? So it's possible to set up a checkmate position, but you need their help, right? Because going back to this position, they could have also decided to go here. And if they decide to go here, guess what? There's no more checkmate. I mean, yeah, you can check them, but there's an escape square and they just run away. Uh, and there's nothing that you can really do, okay? Even if you, you know, try to prevent them from going there. Okay, they move back. Well, they actually can't do that. It's a stalemate now, actually, as I look at it. So th this is the problem. The best case scenario would be a stalemate unless they're just not paying attention and they move into the corner. Okay, so that's what he's trying to, to kind of highlight there. And that is important. Now, why is this important? Well, I'm going to show you. Let me show you guys this position, which really illustrates why it's important that you understand what you can and cannot check with. So I want you to imagine this position. You're playing as white. Black has just moved their pawn here. And you're trying to make the decision, should you trade this pawn or not? What do you guys think the answer is? Well, with the knowledge that you already have about two knights and the king, you should say no. Because if you trade the pawn, even if you're able to capture that with one of your knights, you're not going to be able to win because two knights and a king against a king cannot checkmate, right? So going back to this position, sorry, this position, you should play d5. You should keep that pawn alive. Now use your knights to try to capture these guys and use this guy to become a queen. And then, of course, you will be able to checkmate, right? So for example, the king goes here, I would probably defend that guy. King goes here, I would probably go here and defend my knight, so everything is defended. I've also blockaded this guy, and now I can probably use my king, maybe come up here, start gobbling up the pawns, get a queen, and I win. But knowing that the building blocks of, okay, which pieces can checkmate and which can't, should help you make the decision in a position like this. Okay, so that's very important, and that's why you need to make sure you understand those. All right, now the last thing I want to cover, also from Selman's book, is a queen and a king against a bishop and a king or a knight and a king. Okay, so here's a situation where it's black to move. Black's pawn is about to become a queen. They push it, get the queen. We have a queen and a king versus a king and a bishop. Now, a lot of beginners tend to think that maybe you can somehow survive with the help of the bishop, and you can avoid getting checkmated by the queen. That's just wrong. You, you can't. Okay? You can't survive. The queen is much too powerful against the bishop and against the knight. The knight. Okay, now, against the rook, that's a whole other story. That's a much more advanced endgame. We're not talking about that. But bishops and knights, they can't put up a fight. So as an example, something like this. Bishop moves. The king kind of comes towards the center. The queen comes over. Check. Check. The king comes up. And you always want to, if you are going to try to survive, you want to keep the bishop relatively close to the king because if you go... For example, far away, there's a good chance that you're going to get forked and then you just lose your bishop, something like that. 
Um, and so something like bishop f8 keeps it close. Check. King moves here. Check. King moves there to defend the bishop. Check. King comes up. And notice you don't take it. Okay? You don't take the bishop because that's a stalemate. So what do you do? You simply ignore it. Go king f7. You're coming in here for checkmate and there's nothing that the bishop can do to stop you. Okay? Again, you don't take it. You simply deliver the checkmate. Okay, so there's not much the bishop can do, and actually it even prevents it from being a stalemate in a lot of cases. So it even, you could say, even hurts white from that perspective, okay? So not, not much you could do. Now let's take a look at the queen against the knight. All right, so here's an example of the king and the queen against the king and the knight. Now, it's the same kind of deal where you're gonna force the king uh, into a corner on the side. You just have to watch out for forks, okay? You have to watch out for forks. So in this position, if you played king g2, uh, guess what? You're going to get forked and there goes your chances of, of winning the game, right? You're not going to lose, but you, now it's just a draw, okay? So as long as you avoid the forks and slowly but surely push the king to the edge of the board, you're going to be able to win, okay? So uh, as an example, king comes up, queen comes up, queen check, king comes up, and whenever you, you're going to move your king forward, just make sure there's no knife fork, Okay, so like if you're going to go here, wait a second, that's a check. Okay, but my queen is safe. It's fine. Uh, just keep asking that question. Okay, you want to move your king up. Wait a second. I'm stepping into a fork pattern. Can the knight do that? No, the knight can't get anywhere that would fork me. So I'm fine and I can go here. And you want to use your king and your queen as a team, slowly but surely kind of march up the board towards your opponent's king and just watch out for those forks. Okay, and a lot of the moves are gonna be relatively straightforward and intuitive. You don't need to really like memorize anything. Just kind of think of the ideas. Use the king and the queen together, slowly but surely push the king backwards and watch out for forks. That's it, okay? King comes over, king comes over, check, moves up, check. Boom, this is a great position because look at this. We've got the, the uh, king boxed out here. We now come in with the queen. We force him to the back of the, the board, edge of the board. Okay, we go here, check, we move, check, we move. We are threatening checkmate here. So the knight tries to stop us. And now if you would like to pause, there's a very simple way to kind of finish off the game in a couple of moves. This is a good one to practice. All right, if you had a chance to look at that, the move is queen g7. So if you can ever get a situation like this where you have a checkmate threat, your opponent's knight is stopping it, but now you're attacking the knight. They've got to move the knight, but they don't want to move the knight because you're going to checkmate them. You've basically won the game, okay? They can move the knight and get checkmated here if they want. They cannot move the knight, move their king, and you can either take the knight or just go for the quick queen d7 checkmate as well, right? That's also the fast way. So th there's not really much to worry about as long as you don't step into a fork, okay? So king and a queen against a king and a knight, always going to be a win for the king and a queen. King and a queen against a uh, king and a bishop, like we looked at over here, it's always gonna be a win for the queen as well. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today. As a reminder, this was Silman's Complete Endgame Course and 100 Endgames You Must Know, where all this information came from. Links to those books are in the description if you wanna check those out for yourself. And next time, we'll continue through Silman's Endgame Course. It's still gonna be part two, and I will see you guys there. Thanks for watching. As always, stay sharp, play smart, and take care.